Welcome to Web3 and Whiskey, a podcast about how the decentralized internet will change our lives. In each episode, we react to a future when users and communities have all of the power and when our digital lives will be as vibrant as our real life. And we drink whiskey while we're doing it. I'm your host, Gary Liu. And as always, I am joined by Suresh Balaji, founder of the Web3 Marketers Association, and Malcolm Ong, a product leader and serial entrepreneur. Quick disclaimer, we don't show projects in this podcast, so please do consider any excitement you hear from us to be personal opinion. And our opinion should never be taken as investment advice of any kind. Okay, with that said, today our main topic, which we'll spend a bunch of time talking about, is a fun one. Should Twitter be decentralized? Should Twitter be decentralized? Now, before we get to that, we got to get lubricated for our conversation. So, as always, we're going to start with our whiskeys, gentlemen. Suresh, I'm going to start with you. Looking, looking, looking like a like a early two thousands gamer, my friend, right now. Yes, that's it. I am. I am an early two thousands gamer. I did have the PlayStation One uh, in the early two thousands, which was great fun. You definitely did not need a microphone and a headset for a PlayStation One. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I should have kept it though. You know, I still have fond memories of it. Uh, in fact, I still have my PlayStation 3 floating around somewhere. And my PlayStation 5 is mostly used by my kids. So, Wow, I'm impressed you even have a PS5. Whiskey, what are you drinking today? Whiskey, whiskey. Hey, um, Glen Elgin? Glen Elgin? What do you call it? Elgin or Elgin? I think it's Elgin. Elgin. So it, this, this puppy is uh, 18 years old. Uh, no longer a puppy, I guess. Um, it says bottle number five three five zero or five three five two so it's limited edition uh and it is supposed to have hints of green apple so this is my one of five a day one of five drums or one of five veggies (laughs) one of five veggies a day so look it should have some no i I can't find the green apple but definitely tastes of good whiskey smells of good whiskey yeah glen algin that's not a common one don't see that very often. Yeah, Glen Elgin, eighteen. Yeah. How's it taste? Yeah. Nice, proper, nice, proper whiskey tumbler. Oh man, this is amazing. I mean, next IRL, I'm bringing this one. I want you guys to taste this. This is brilliant. Smooth, amazing. That is, that is, that is apple. I'm not sure if it's green. Um, you, there is there is some sort of um, oaky end to it, but I, I absolutely love it. I think it's one of my top favorites. Wow! Thank you for sharing, Suresh. Uh, Malcolm, what about you? What whiskey are we drinking today? All right, today I got something a little bit special. It's the McAllen Harmony Collection. Uh, so, still a single malt Scotch. Um, the Harmony Collection first started in 2019. Um, their first collection, there's there's two different versions. One's intense and one's smooth. And so their first collection uh, was inspired by cacao um, as the kind of flavoring as part of that. This second collection is inspired by Arabica coffee. Um, this is the intense version. They have another version called the smooth. Um, this in particular, I think launched just in October, 2022. So just a few months ago, and it's limited to 10,000 bottles. In fact, they said one bottle per customer, at least on their website, one bottle per customer with a unique email address and phone number and shipping address. Um, so you're, you're limited if you're looking to buy it online. Yeah. The KYC to make sure you can't get more than one. (laughs) Exactly. And, And Malcolm, did you go drinking this whiskey without inviting all of us yesterday? I, I got invited to an event yesterday, it's sort of a launch, uh, I guess it's a launch event in Hong Kong yesterday. Um, so I got to, t- to try it out. And it's a it's it's very interesting. I mean, I, I'm a fan of McAllen's in general. This is a blended uh, McAllen, um, uh, matured in sherry casks. So um, they even say on the box, they even say on the box, kind of the notes that are expected here, or at least what they were going for, a little cappuccino and tiramisu, gingerbread, vanilla. Um, I definitely get a little bit of some sort of sweet dessert, like a tiramisu on the nose. And it does taste of a little bit of, you can taste that coffee uh, kind of through it a little bit, a little bit light, but um, still very much in the calendar. So 
Absolutely. That sounds lovely. I'm going to have to come over to your place to steal a drum with that. All right. Today, I have a very unique Thompson Brothers. In fact, this is a first release, and I'll explain this in just a second. Um, I think before I brought a Thompson Brothers independent bottling uh, to the podcast, I, I love Thompson Bros independent bottlings. They, they, they do very unique things with single casks. But Thompson Brothers, they also actually founded and run a uh, Scotch distillery um, in, in Dornock. So the Dornock distillery was founded by the actual two brothers. Um, and they bottle their own original bottlings. But this is a very unique thing. This is what is known as a living cask or um, something that is bottled as a Solera. So what that is, and this is the first edition of it, what that is is that they take a, they, they take a barrel and then they fill it with whiskey, they blend it in the barrel. And then every single year, they bottle part of what is in the cask. And then once they bottle it, then they add something else to it. But the cask is never empty. So year after year after year, there's always a little bit of the last year's expression left in the cask with new whiskeys added in right, over time. So this was the first expression, and it was an eight-year, okay? which means that all the whiskeys that they mix in this cask were at least aged for eight years. Then they bottled it for the very first time out of this living cask. Um, and then next year... They're going to have, have left a little bit of this in the cast. They would have added other like nine-year whiskeys to it. And then over time, it will the, the cask itself will change its flavor. And if, uh, if I'm you know, lucky enough every single year to pick up a bottle of this year after year after year, you can taste how the, the, the single cask has changed over time. So um, this one I've already tried before, and I'll be honest. It's not a great whiskey. But I bought it, and I'm uh, and I'm going to keep it, and I'm going to treasure it because this is going to be the first of what I hope will be an ever evolving series of whiskeys that will get more and more interesting with age. It's very very harsh um, at the start because it's eight years. It's 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 just it, it, it's not quite smoothed out yet. Um, it is it still it tastes young like the young whiskeys that have a lot of sharp edges to them. You can taste a little bit of the flavoring coming through. Um, it's not, it's not sweet. There's not a lot of vanilla on it. Uh, you really taste the malt. Um, but what's really interesting about this is it's a very, very long finish. I think it's because of the alcohol content. It's a very long finish. Um, but it is crisp. So if, if there are distinct flavors in this, and I'm a little bit stuffed up today, so I can't really smell well, but if there are distinct flavors, it is fruits. Um, but it's not mellowed fruits. It's not like a, like a Dawini. So, um, it's it's an okay whiskey. It is definitely not the top of what the Thompson Brothers produce, but check with me again in a year, and maybe I'll have a second bottling of it to start comparing it to. So, gentlemen, let's get to our topic. Now that we've started with the whiskeys, I'm sure we'll have a lot of opinions about this. Should Twitter be decentralized? Now, Twitter is such an interesting platform and such an interesting topic in so many ways. Twitter is a Web2 platform that influences Web3 beyond, I think, what most people in Web3 even recognize. Now, Twitter itself, even in Web2, has long been a lightning rod because it has so much influence with so few really active users, but such incredibly loud voices. Right? As a distribution channel, it is the fastest distribution channel for information. There is no journalist in the world who... I mean, it works on breaking news who does not live on Twitter. In fact, I, I have to imagine that pretty much every journalist in the world lives on Twitter, right? Um, it's the fastest channel for int uh, information distribution, but it also impacts public opinion with a speed that we've never seen before. No newspaper can impact public opinion as fast as Twitter can. No newscast, TV channel, no YouTube channel, frankly, um, can impact global opinion as quickly as Twitter can. And over the years, it has therefore been kind of manipulated and, uh, and it's become the keystone of a lot of arguments around free speech versus gatekeeping, around the influence of Silicon Valley in uh, politics all around the world, especially in American politics. And there have been big personalities who've gone to kind of world-shaking, industry-changing fights publicly on Twitter. 
Um, and it just get, keeps getting crazier, especially now that our friend Elon Musk, and by friend, I mean, no, we don't actually know Elon, but we want to pretend that, that we do. Now that Elon Musk owns Twitter, this incredible deal where he bought Twitter for $44 billion, borrowed a heck of a lot of money to buy it, um, it's only become even more controversial. So big influence, a small number of contributors, lots of loud noises, right? And by the way, I, I want to clarify. When I say small number of, 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 uh, of uh, contributors, Twitter's like monthly active user base is about 400 some million. Daily active users, a little over 200 million, okay? Um, so it's, it's big. Don't get me wrong. I don't think those numbers are small. It's big. But I say it's small because of two reasons. One, its monthly active user number is a fraction of m the other major social media networks out there. From Facebook to Instagram to WhatsApp to Google and YouTube, all of these are measured in multiple billions in MAU. Twitter is 400 million. And then even though there is 200 million active, daily active users, uh, the reality is that the average amount of time that people spend on Twitter is about four minutes to six minutes a day. It's a very, very short amount of time. And most people and most of those active users are just consuming. They do not post. And so the number of people who actually post on Twitter is much smaller. Best estimates are around 10% of that DAU number. So we're really talking only somewhere between 20 to 30 million people who are contributing to this network that can change public opinion and, uh, and, and frankly can shape truth in a matter of seconds, right? So that's why it, it's, it's so interesting, such a small number of contributors with such major influence. So I wanna start with some base questions. We're not gonna get to the decentralization in the first question. The base question is, Twitter can mean, can, it is many things to many people. What does Twitter actually mean to each of you? Let me start with Malcolm. What is Twitter to you and what does it represent? Yeah, I think Twitter, you know, as people say, is like the internet's town hall. And to me, it is it is sort of like that. It's the place that we can go to and effectively talk to any celebrity brand person on the internet and have these conversations in near real time, right? I think the reason why... I use Twitter for news, for learning, for communication, is frankly because of its speed in a way. Um, I hear stuff on Twitter before I read a lot of you know news on uh, news websites or from news publishers, and you can have immediate conversations with people directly on Twitter uh, because of that. So to me, it, it truly acts as this big, big, big community of you know, the most active users, if you will, online, talking about whatever is current. And, and so that's, that's what it represents to me. Suresh, what about you as a marketer, especially? Yeah, I think personally for me, I think I was a very active user of Twitter um, in, the, in 2007, 2008, perhaps. In the, in the early days, um, it, was, it was the place where... Um, leading edge thinking when it came to innovation, creativity, and everything else was. I think over a period of time, um, I think the 140 characters really was quite restrictive up until recently. And then I, I went away from there to, and LinkedIn is my sort of uh, social media vehicle of choice. And in fact, I don't tweet, I post on LinkedIn, which gets tweeted, right? So I, I use it as the uh, it, it's 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 sort of I, I use it for sometimes for single sign-ons and things like those. So that's my that's me personally. Secondly, as a marketer, I think all most marketers, uh, at least good marketers, look for category growth. Um, and category growth from a marketing perspective is not going to come from Twitter because, to your point, Gary, there are half a billion people on Twitter around the world, and um, you know many markets. The penetration of Twitter is quite low, so. So it's it's a sort of a quick flash medium where people don't go there for in-depth stuff. Of course, now there are you know tweet threads and live tweets and um, you know the the, the whole um, the, the town hall type um, you know the the um, live uh, microphone um, audio town halls that are, are, are webcast that they have. There's a whole, I forget what it's called, but there's this whole host of new features. Oh yeah, Twitter spaces, buddy hell. Um, and all of those are now. 
Yeah, they basically swallowed Clubhouse and and, the, and the, all the ideas that Clubhouse had, which is fascinating. So I think they've gotten there. But as a brand, uh, which is the third angle to to which I look at it, I think it's it struggled a little bit um, from the days of Jack when it was the when it became the platform for true free speech, then it went on to the sort of the po- uh, sort of neo woke era where they started started taking a stance on. Uh, what they should moderate and what they shouldn't moderate. And then in comes Elon. Uh, and um, I don't know what's happened to its brand right now. I would imagine if it was not for Web3 communities and some of the other innovators there, I think Twitter would struggle uh, to be a platform of choice for anyone. So I think the community is holding it together. And I, I really don't think uh, it is it is a place where people, I don't know what active signups now are. Um, so as a brand, I I think it's a big question mark for me. Yeah, to me, Twitter is just one of the most unique, incredible tools that uh, the public internet has given birth to. Um, It is so incredibly influential and impactful in our lives. I think that if Twitter were really to shut down one one day, um, that's when we will realize how incredibly important it has become to modern life. Um, I actually don't know what happens in the news industry if Twitter gets shut down. Uh, I'm sure something else will pop up and try and replace it. There have been m- multiple attempts at replacing or providing an alternative to Twitter. But it's not just the technology itself. That's not too difficult to replicate. It's the networks that have been built over the course of the last 13, 14 years on Twitter that you cannot overnight replicate. doesn't matter if you import all of your contacts and whatnot. That network effect is just not going to uh, be the same right? without Twitter as it is today. Um, and so I think the distribution mechanism of information through Twitter is phenomenal. I think that it has deserved a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the vitriol and anger thrown at it because over the years it has squandered a lot of opportunities to do right by the world and right by its power or the power that it wields and holds. Um, but I am very, very fearful of Twitter being disintermediated or uh, being run into the ground and disappearing. I think we'll actually be a worse off a society without an information source like Twitter, without the conf- conversations that happen on Twitter. We could definitely do without the hate that is on Twitter. I'd absolutely have a love-hate relationship with Twitter. I was off of Twitter for several years. And uh, ironically, while I was uh, the CEO of a major news organization, <laughs> because I realized how toxic uh, the community can be, and I just didn't have the mind share for it. Um, but a few years later, I came back on initially just as a consumer. Actually, I mean, still, frankly, just a consumer. I, I post, but not on my official Twitter accounts. So and no one really knows uh, what my what my other Twitter accounts are. Uh, I engage in that way, but primarily as a consumer. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so so Twitter to me is a is, is one of the the the, the really uh, important but extremely difficult to uh, to you know understand corners of the uh, of the internet. Do you guys think there's like an inflection point when t- Twitter became that important or influential? Like certainly for crypto and Web three, it's a big thing. Um, certainly for Trump, you know, during the Trump era, it was a, it, the era it was a big thing. Um, but I wonder if there was a single inflection point that really turned the tie for Twitter or if it's just more of a gradual thing that happens? Yeah, I, I, I have a couple, right? I think the first one was Arab Spring. Um, and that, that was the point when, you know, when this, you know, so-called revolutions were, were ignited because of Twitter, because official channels went away. And I was in the Middle East then and you could really see uh, Twitter becoming the platform for "Quote unquote free speech," and uh, when when most channels were shut down, um, you know, Twitter became that one. So this this was sort of in the sort of um, 2009, 2010. I don't know. It, I think that was then. The second big point was in I think inflection point was um, the presidential elections when Obama got uh, elected, and I think it, the Democratic Party really figured out that social media was the route to go. And uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, both of them became channels of choice. And uh, those were the two big moments when Twitter, in my view at least, uh, it, it, it took a leap into 
uh, mass adoption uh, when people really wanted to know what was going on and when um, when presidential accounts were set up um, I actually met the fella who was running the was running the democratic social media uh, campaign and um, it is fascinating the early days of them trying to figure out um, they they didn't realize how much power it wielded to Gary's point um, when they, when they were when they were starting to use the use these and then when what started off as let us use these channels um, to to reach out to um, you know communities that we couldn't reach online uh, and let's let's reach out to these channels for uh, donations and funding it started as, as a fundraising exercise using social media and they figured out that they could move public opinion i think the big big point was uh, the presidential elections um when when it was hillary versus trump and uh, the bots took over um that is when that was the point when we figured out this could it's it's not just the positive power of creating communities there could be there could be crazy power that that foreign forces could use so i went to a presentation by i think this was general hayden who was the who was the ex cia and ex fbi director i think i think he was general hayden and he spoke about this was maybe maybe 5 years ago and he spoke about the biggest worry that he thought he was retired at that point and he thought he had was uh, weaponization of social media uh it was quite and it was not even cyber crime uh, to that level where somebody would hack into but his 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 point of view was uh bots could weaponize uh, social media and drive public opinion then what happens which is what is scary right and one as a news source and two as um it can be it can be used to move nations bring votes uh change policy um you know drive drive polarizing opinion okay so on to my next question then with all this power, and, and and by the way, one thing to note is that it, Twitter's not monolithic. Uh, there are many different Twitters, right? Uh, and my uh, me myself, I I think I'm part of at least four or five quote unquote Twitters from the same account, right? Um, but with all this influence across so many different sub communities and so many different areas of interest and and so much of the world, what then would an actual decentralized Twitter look like? When we ask the question, should Twitter be decentralized? Let, let's before we answer, should it be? Let's talk about what it would look like if it were decentralized. So, Malcolm, let's start with you. What do you think it looks like if if Twitter uh, were decentralized? What changes, if anything? Yeah, I'm. I mean, we've seen some examples of this. There's some startups that are ex- trying this exactly right. One in particular um, is called Mastodon, and so a decentralized Twitter. What it what it really means is that rather than having a centralized entity like Twitter itself controlling everything, you would have the decentralized Twitter be controlled by a federated network, meaning, you know, instead of a single server, it's basically a bunch of different servers, a bunch of different computer nodes that ho- that's hosted by different users, right, rather than a single entity. And so imagine you have distributed, decentralized computer servers, um, each running their own mini version of Twitter in, in a sense. So that's like part one. Um, you can, the way I almost think about that is imagine if you ever use Reddit, right? Reddit has a bunch of different subreddits, a bunch of different channels. And so imagine if every single subreddit was sort of its own server, its own thing, its own community, and therefore it's run by or controlled by um, that, you know, users servers themselves so i think that's 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 part one but what this creates is that everything in in terms of the 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 benefits and value of web3 because a decentralized twitter means that you can then own as a user own your own profile right and own your own decentralized identity this also means that you control and you own the social graph so all the friends and all the followers that you have can is, is decentralized. So you own that, meaning it's also portable. You can move that around. So a decentralized server, I can go from one server to another server and I can move my profile around, my identity around, and I can move this social graph and follower uh, network around. And then finally, the content itself, right? So the content's not controlled or owned by the centralized entity. It's owned by me, right? And so in a way, it's censorship resistant. It's open to anyone, 
right? And with the ethos of the way that a lot of these decentralized social platforms are using it, it's, it's very open source, it's very transparent. Um, and because it's also controlled by a, a network of nodes, they're also less susceptible to downtime, to outages and things like that. That, that in my mind is the core of what a decentralized Twitter might look like. Now, there's a bunch of other things we can talk about that layers on top of that, right? You talk about how NFTs and tokens are used, how that can change monetization um, uh, structures within it. You can then imagine that uh, KOLs or influencers or celebrities within Twitter, they can effectively reach their quote unquote audiences and their true fans directly and monetize that way. So there's a bunch of other things on top of that, um, that we can talk about a little bit later, but that's, that's the core of what I envision. Suresh, is there anything you want to add to what a decentralized Twitter is? I think so. I mean, I, I loved it, Malcolm. I loved the way that you broke it down. And I just want to say that what if, you know, I'm thinking of what would Twitter tokenomics look like and what would a dollar Twitter look like? And how would that ecosystem work? And how would those communities use a, a tokenized platform? And they, they're, 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 the, the possibilities are unlimited, right? And all the things that we know and we love about Web3, the ability for them to create um, commerce and, and opportunities for commerce within, within Twitter. And those communities can own their respective sub-communities uh, in some way, and their participation is being uh, perhaps, um, you know, in, in, in many ways, the, the, the advent of the participation economy and people's, people get paid for their participation in dollar Twitter. Maybe the, the blue ticks verification happens through, you know, paying in dollar Twitter. And if there is, there's probably a big opportunity for Elon to just create uh, a community based, uh, not a single source, single point of failure. Uh, based web web two organi organism versus a true web three, uh, that would be wouldn't that be phenomenal? Yeah, I I, I agree with with both of you uh, you guys on on what a decentralized Twitter could look like. That the two main things that I think uh, are interesting and could be massive changes to the Twitter ecosystem is the interoperability of your social network on your social graph on Twitter. Uh, we already mentioned that that is the thing that can't be replicated. You can replicate the technology. You can't even po port like all the users from one to another magically, but just the network effects, uh, who's con uh, con uh, connected to whom, what the conversations have been had in the past, that can't be replicated. It's not overnight, not over years. Uh, it may take the, the decades that Twitter's been in the zeitgeist uh, to replicate. Um, but to be able to take that and port that to something else, because it's self-sovereign. It's owned by the user. That's interesting. Um, the second thing is the censorship issue. Twitter is a gatekeeper of information. Any social network that has an algorithm is that. And Twitter has an algorithm. Now, Twitter's gone beyond just the algorithm by having all these rules about banning accounts, about taking down certain posts, um, about restricting the distribution of certain posts, um, and so that goes beyond an algorithm, but just the fact that they are an algorithm, they have an algorithm, uh, means that they are a gatekeeper. And especially again, with the kind of influence, the, the, the fact that Twitter, uh, is all about speed and the breadth of distribution, the, the, the contagion impact of information. The moment they dial that speed down, even just by a micro fraction, uh, it could change the way that information travels and the way that the world sees the world. Uh, so they are a gatekeeper. Um, when it becomes decentralized, that gatekeeping is no longer controlled by a single corporation and that corporation's leadership or that corporation's ethos. It becomes up to the community. And the big question I think we have to ask uh, before we can make a determination of whether or not we should decentralize Twitter is whether or not, first of all, gatekeeping of information distribution is needed and necessary and important. And number two, if it still is, can a community effectively do it? Do we really believe that, quote unquote, demographically uh, determined gatekeeping actually works? This is, we, we, we're, by the way, assuming that the way a decentralized Twitter is built cannot be gamed and hacked and bad actors don't exist, right? Uh, which is already a crazy assumption. Even in that like utopian 
expectation, can community uh, run gatekeeping actually be effective? So why don't we jump to those two questions? First of all, does anyone here believe that gatekeeping of information in this day and age is no longer necessary? I think it's uh, okay. I think gatekeeping of information is necessary, but it's a necessary evil. Oh, okay. So, so here's the thing, right? I mean, the, the Web three. Let's let's step take one step back to Web three and say, what are the what are, what's the starting point of Bitcoin and blockchain and everything else that Satoshi Nakamoto was hoping it would it would be? And if you see, uh, in many ways, the whole the Bitcoin any Bitcoin maximalist is usually a freedom maximalist. Um, they are. It's about uh, you know life, liberty, and property. Um, how does one really uh, you know, achieve freedom and the whole idea of uh, what is the role of, you know, governments. And in many ways, the way that they describe it is, um, you know, currency uh, is is sort of, is, is by, by centralizing currency and centralizing um, monetary policy and fiscal policy, you are, you are going to, you are going to single point of failure. And the if the, if the role of the government, for example, is to be the network uh, administrator of uh, you know of of the rights that human beings have in in the certain geography, how much right how much what's what what rights do the network administrator administrator have to shut down um, different sort of nodes is the big question, right? So that's that's where the freedom maximum is coming to this, right? So there's a bigger philosophical debate around freedom, no freedom, etc. But eventually, um, what we have seen is in the absence of the you know in the absence of any sort of policing any sort of law any sort of legal framework any sort of rules uh, human beings uh, time and again we devolve exactly right they devolve to something terrible ideally we want to get to a place where i mean you see i, I mean i'm part of so many of these discord communities where um, people are i mean there are people who are flooding the project who are going crazy who are who are who are being nasty, all of that, and then the community finds a way of chucking them out, because the community takes over and they go, okay, there is organ rejection of negativity or organ rejection of non, I mean the the the, un, the the ethos that one doesn't want. I think human beings as social creatures can create it, right? But I think at this point in time, especially if you're crossing borders, if you're if you're if you are if you are being op- if if the platform is. Um, you know, universal from an age perspective, uh, I think um, gatekeeping is is a necessity. I mean, how how are we defining gatekeeping, right? Because maybe that's the wrong word, by the way. Moderation, content moderation. Let's say moderation. I, I think it should absolutely exist. It's I think it's more of a question though, like who is in charge of the moderation, right? And maybe that's the thing. Where is it a centralized entity like Twitter that's in charge of the moderation, or should that be? A, more decentralized and more community-based moderation. But in either case, it's still moderation, right? Because how can you allow any speech to happen where it's either, let's say, falsehoods or fake news or just general harassment, right? So I don't think any of that should be allowed. Well, it's fascinating, right, Malcolm? And here's the the thing, right? So so let's go to the 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 bigger social media in play, which is Facebook, with three and a half billion users. What Facebook tried to do was to moderate it by by putting RBs of people, by training AIs, by doing all sorts of stuff. People, I mean, and there is no way that once there is scale, any AI, any human being can really really figure out how to moderate for harassment because harassment can happen through emojis. Harassment can happen through words in the zeitgeist, in popular culture. If if somebody's harassing you with the words that the AI knows, then it is it is it's fine. If somebody is trying to harass through, so so where does it? So one of one of Facebook's biggest challenges has been how far can they go? How much time, effort, money, energy do they throw into trying to moderate? And then it becomes a question, which is which is back to Gary's earlier point, which is. Because they have the algorithms, because they take a stance on what to shut down and what they shouldn't shut down, they're no longer a dump pipe. They are not AT&T. They are not Vodafone. They're not Smart Tone. They can't just say that we are we are just a platform and anything anybody can communicate anything. Well, in the same way, we are not going to go to, um, let's say, you know, 
Zoom and say, hey, you need to moderate all calls that happen on Zoom or Google Meet. It's impossible. So how, where, is, where do we draw the line? I, I think it's, it is really important since, Suresh, you brought up like the, the overall philosophy of, of crypto, like Satoshi, right? All the way back to Satoshi. To, to realize that when we're talking about Web3, at least I do not believe that the fundamental first principles of Web3 are the exact same as the first principles of Bitcoin. Okay. They, they, they're similar and there's a lot of overlap, but I don't think that they are one to one. And by the way, I certainly do not believe that Web3 should be built on the philosophy of maximalists because uh, when you're talking about people who are maximizing for freedom, freedom maximalists, there's another word that describes that and it's anarchist, right? So um, I don't believe that Web3 should be uh, built on the philosophy of, of, of anarchy um, or anarchism. And so Web3 in... in the, the, in my mind, the value of a decentralized internet and applications built on top of a decentralized internet is empowerment. Empowerment of individuals through ownership. Ownership of their data, ownership of their identities, ownership of their assets. And the ability, therefore, for communities to come together and bring the assets that they own into the fold and say, hey, we can do something really, really special with this. And I, I think that this actually uh, it, it mirrors much more the original philosophy of the internet than that of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain, right? Um, and that's what I'm building for. That's what I want to get to. But in that world, I believe empowerment still requires rules. Society requires rules. They're the best societies in the world. I mean, they're just, I have not yet run, and I, I'm not a historian. I we, Maybe we invite a historian onto this podcast and ask them the question uh, or we email one. And ask, has there ever truly been a outright free society that has prospered over generations um, with no rules, right? With just just uh, a social compact um, that is unwritten, that is that is uh, you know just expected custom uh, customs and behavior, and that has flourished. I have a really really hard time imagining uh, that because of human nature, right? The way you're talking about. It. And so the Web3 that I imagine that I want to build that is empowering individuals with ownership still requires rules. And when it comes to information, especially in this day and age, when truth is so opaque at times, uh, and it's it's already under contention even with true gatekeepers in place, I, I think that a world without those gatekeepers uh, would be tr really, really scary. So I, I think the three of us all at least agree on this point is that some kind of moderation, content moderation, I apologize, I keep using the term gatekeeping, but some kind of moderation is important. Uh, we may disagree on the degree to which uh, content moderation is necessary or even effective. Okay? So um, then that said, so if, if there is some kind of moderation that's necessary, can a decentralized network where everyone who is an equal participant has equal vote on how it operates, can a, can a network, can a community of people actually come up with the right rules, evolve those rules in complexity and, and, and crisis, right? And be able to do it at scale, at speed, uh, effectively, right? To be able to moderate all the information that passes through Twitter today. Yeah, I think this is tough, right? Because I think... It can eventually, but what would be required for it to happen is these decentralized servers and effectively like groups of people that govern this, right? So, so first of all, I agree that's a spectrum where if, if Twitter and centralized entities are on one side and free for all is on the other side, uh, what I think of as decentralized um, networks is sort of in the middle, right? Where it's instead of being controlled by a single entity, it's still controlled by um, a small number of entities. It's it's not a single, but it's also not every single uh, single user. But what this means therefore is the technology and the tools that Twitter and Facebook has needs to also be accessible to all those other players, right? So if, I, if Mastodon has hundreds and thousands of servers that are controlled by decentralized nodes, and content moderation happens on a community level, the community themselves need to have this exact same tools, right? To be able to operate at the same level of sophistication, which is where I think is the 
challenge. For something like content moderation, if it requires so much manpower and so much AI and machine learning and data, unless that is also accessible and available to everyone, then it's going to be very difficult to replicate that in a decentralized manner. And then when it comes to the actual power of voting too, by the way, it's not just the imbalance of information. Some may actually understand this stuff uh, more acutely, have more experience with it, and therefore can make more intelligent um, decisions. Some might have access to uh, to information that, that, that Malcolm mentioned or the tools that Malcolm mentioned while others don't. But in a world like Twitter, can't you like wouldn't you imagine that if it really becomes community moderation that power would be unequally distributed based on one's influence so the trumps and the ronaldos of the world would hold undue power to determine how information is moderated in a decentralized network versus you and me but so the question is is that okay and because I think it effectively would create all these additional echo chambers, right? Instead of one single echo chamber, you have a bunch of smaller echo chambers. Um, and at the end of the day, maybe it's okay because the only people that are going to be interacting in Trump's decentralized, you know, by the way, Tr Truth Social was actually based off of Mastodon. It's, it looks very different today, but it initially was based off of that. And so if Trump's uh, Truth Social uh, has its own network, has its own fans and users and followers, they're going to be at their own echo chamber no matter what. Um, so on the one hand, it's like, well, okay, maybe that's fine for them. But on the other hand, yeah, we're not really solving any of the root problems that we discussed earlier. Yeah, this is it, right? So now if what we're saying is eventually if we decentralize Twitter, it will end up becoming like a dis like Discord where there are hundreds and thousands of servers and and they they're just doing their own thing, and there is no point. I think po Twitter's um, power is its ubiquitousness across communities that is not gated. It's anyone, everyone's welcome. Anybody can follow anyone unless they're really private. They 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 deem to be private, and and there's no filtering of uh, you know you, you you don't belong to my echo chamber. Come on in. So it is got it's it's an ecosystem rather than an echo chamber. It's all public, right? That's what makes Twitter so interesting. It's exactly. And that would go away uh, if we land up if we land up decentralizing it into smaller pockets. But but what if what if if I mean we we our reference is Discord and Mastodon. What if it remained a public channel but still was decentralized and it was just one huge half a billion people community? I mean that's like Reddit, right? Where it has a bunch of subreddits and channels. So imagine every single subreddit was on its own rules, right? Governed by its own community. Um, which, for example, like Mastodon, right? They allow characters and messages up to 500 instead of Twitter's 280. But a lot of servers actually fork that source code to change that rule as well. So they increase that limit, right? So then imagine you have all these subreddits just kind of running in their own communities. The thing with Reddit, though, is that Reddit has universal rules. Reddit bans and, 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 and wipes off the planet certain subreddits that should never exist, right? And we are largely grateful for them to them for doing that. Um, they limit what moderators can actually do in their own subreddits, right? And listen, I, I I'm a daily act, active Reddit user. Um, I have never understood all the hoopla around it, like all the anger around Reddit's rules and rules changes. I've I found the vast majority of rules changes over the last few years to be not only reasonable but necessary. And frankly speaking, there is a still a huge amount of margin for uh, Reddit sub, the subreddit communities and moderators to just decide how their world, what they, the, how they want their world to, to operate. Uh, but there are still universal rules. So a truly decentralized Twitter would not even have those universal rules, right? Unless, unless um, it's, I don't know, like determined by the original yeah, community and, 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 and the, the smart contract, right? For the actual, uh, the, the, I mean, I actually don't even know at what la layer the smart contract would control, but if uh, if those rules were hard coded uh, into the way the decentralized network could operate, but then the problem is that it can never change, right? Unless you completely fork it and make it something other. So, um, 
I think partial decentralization would have to be the path forward where the ownership aspect, owning your network uh, and all those conversations um, and owning your data is decentralized and therefore can be ported or interoperable from one place to another, where to some degree uh, rules and the, the, the way a network operates server to server uh, can be determined by the actual community that operates it. But... <clears throat> but still with centralized universal rules, as well as uh, centralized content distribution, especially if there is a consolidated homepage, right? Without that, without that, 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 uh, that content moderation, I think uh, a decentralized Twitter would make the world worse. W where's the value of a decentralized Twitter? Malcolm Suresh, where, where's the additional value added to the world by decentralizing Twitter? I mean, I think I agree with you because the problems that people point out that decentralized Twitters are supposed to solve are the things that you mentioned in terms of being able to port content and data, right? And be able to own that content. Because if you have a centralized entity that owns that content at any time, they could technically ban you. And so all the followers that you built up, all the content you created is immediately lost. So if we at least have... Uh, data ownership and portability around our profile, our identity, our content, then maybe that solves that problem, right? But then the second piece is certainly the the censorship piece. And that that I don't know. If you have content moderation for a consolidated like homepage or distribution to people that do not follow you, uh, which Twitter does today, right? That's That's algorithmic. I think that's justifiable. I think, however, if you decentralize, you cannot stop Individual X from communicating, uh, communicating absolute BS to all of their followers, right? Because if they own their network and they own their identity, right? Their and 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 therefore the their ability to communicate directly to those who have chosen to follow, then you shouldn't be able to. If it's decentralized, you shouldn't be able to touch that. So you would still you would still have end up, I think, with this uh, this echo chamber problem where Trump on a decentralized internet and all of the Trumpies, um, the MAGA people would still get complete and utter disinformation, right? That the, the election was stolen or that COVID is not real. Um, all of that, that stuff would still be out there. It just would be seen primarily by um, people who choose to see that kind of trash. Uh, and it's not, it doesn't get into the heads and the ears of people who haven't chosen that. Um, may, I mean that as I guess that's an incremental improvement. <laughs> but, but but Gary, by by this is it, right? At this point, we what you know by by this by saying that the MAGA people are sort of consumers of fake news and they thrive on it. We have already taken a view that this is we we've already taken a stance and a view. If it is the real world, let's take let's take let's take Twitter out for and let's think of IRL in the main. And if anyone wants to create a voice based echo chamber, let's say that I was a right wing fundamentalist and I wanted to gather everyone in in Boston to come and listen to me. I bring them all into a big hall and I can still talk about what I feel and how I feel. And that echo chamber will still exist. The question here is, who gives Twitter the right to decide what is f real for them or what is fake for them or what is right and what is wrong? And that's where it fundamentally comes to it. But hold on, why would they not have the right? Why would they not have the right? They're, 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 they're a company. So they absolutely have the right. That, that's the question. Yeah, that's the question. So if they, they, they have, this is the thing. So... If they have, I mean, uh, on the, on, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to debate the topic to say what is the, what's the whole feeling, right? You know, you know, my, my view on this is, you know, my, I'm, I'm, my view on this is, yes, it definitely should be moderated because of all the bad actors, right? But if you want to stretch it, to stretch it to a point, right? If you stretch it to a point, say, let us say that there is a, there is, there is Twitter in a certain jurisdiction. In that jurisdiction, the, the government are the bad actors. Um, they are they are trying to control the society in in a, in a way that they shouldn't, and they land up taking a sense that they they ring Twitter and say, hey, um, there is there are, there are all of these elements who are anti-government 
and we want to suppress them. Can you please go and do that? And that could happen. I think that's the whole idea of a decentralized place, which is nobody can, you know, a, a, a um, let's say some sort of an authoritarian or uh, dictatorship type of a government goes in and says, shut something down when they shouldn't. So what happens then? If you are decentralized, it, maybe it won't. I'm just trying to figure out what are the potential pros of a really decentralized Twitter? Yeah, so I, I do think that, I mean, I'm maybe I'm convincing myself at this point, but I do think that um, if, if there is an approach where certain parts of Twitter, as we know it today, are decentralized, the ownership of your own username and identity, the ownership of your networks and therefore the follower, the, your, your social graph, the ownership of the actual content um, and, uh, and your own data. If that's decentralized, then it stops uh, what you're talking about, right? It stops actual individual censorship. If somebody has decided to follow what I'm saying, truth, non-truth, whatever it is, um, they should have a right to hear what I'm saying. Um, but the part that still requires centralization, in my opinion, is if that choice, that individual choice, that if any information starts to leak out of that choice, right? Uh, whether it's because of uh, you know, of having a, a consolidated homepage uh, or because there is some algorithm that makes content suggestions to individuals based on their preferences, and stuff like that. I do think that in that case, um, having a decentralized content moderation would never work uh, and that there still needs to be centralized gatekeeping. And you can decide to turn that off, to say, I don't want any of that. I don't want uh, in, in any algorithm to mess with the information that I'm getting. I just want the people that I follow um, that's your choice. That's your prerogative, right? Cause, and, and you own all of those connections. Those will never be taken away from you. The people that you want to listen to will never be shut down. They'll never be silenced. Right? So you can still get what information you want. Um, you just don't let the centralized authority, uh, which is the company supplement, uh, your information choice with other things that the algorithm decides you might be interested in, or you might need to know. So, so here's a, another question for you in this case, right? So let's assume that that happens and you own all your data and you own all your tweets and you own all your conversations and, you know, the connections and the network that you've built. The whole idea of Web2 and everything that we hate about it, Web2 is when, when you get something for free, when you get a product for free, you're the product, right? That was the, that's the sort of what came out of Web2, right? And I, I'm just, if someone told me, go and build this, how would this platform be sustainable and who would fund it because currently advertisers fund twitter because they they you they go for the data that you produce all the exhaust that you produce by connecting reaching tweeting they get insight they get information and it's 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 the it's the advertising industry it's it, it takes a its revenues as a chunk of the advertising industry what would happen i think you can think of it as almost like if a dao controlled every server in a way then they would be crowdfunded. They would be funded by the community, right? And they could decide their own monetization uh, structure. And then you can use tokens and tokenomics to um, incentivize users to do X, Y, Z. For example, there's another decentralized social network called Minds, which is replacing Facebook. And it's actually one of the larger ones. Uh, it has, I think, close to 6 million users right now. Um, and they have their own token and they use that to incentivize users to you know, publish content to, they, you know, they encourage people to contribute to the ecosystem, referring others to the platform. Um, so I would imagine it's sort of like a DAO running its own community. And in this world, in a decentralized Twitter, if you as an individual really do own your feed, you get to control exactly what you see on your feed and no one else, um, except with your permission, is allowed to come into your feed. Then that becomes powerful. Then an individual, then Suresh with a three, right? gets to say, hey, here's my data. I will volunteer it and I will volunteer my, 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 my feed for X number of advertisements every single day. And advertisers will still be able to directly communicate with you, knowing what your preferences are, knowing who you are and what you care about. But it's all on your terms. At any point in time, you can stop all of that, right? If you allow it, the advertising feed goes directly to you or goes, you know, a portion of it, maybe a small portion of it goes to the network to make sure that it can continue to operate, right? To run the operating cost of it. Uh, but then the rest of it goes to the individual. So there is a very different type of exchange that can happen 
when an individual becomes empowered with their own data and their own access and their own network. I could see that. I think there's a, the, I think there's a podcast there on advertising in the world of Web3 mm -hmm. in, in, in with decentralized data. I think there's an entire series on it. I think there, I think there's, there's a company in that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, we can go on for a, a, a while longer. I, I, I don't think, I think we've only scratched the surface of what a decentralized Twitter could look like. But as of right now, having talked about it, what it would mean for the ownership of network data assets, what it would mean for content moderation, what it would mean for uh, silos of information, information distribution. Uh, we've already also talked about how we could separate out aspects of Twitter today for decentralization while others remain centralized. With all that said, and I know we're just scratching the surface, let's go back to that original question. Should Twitter be decentralized? Is there enough value in decentralizing parts of Twitter to even consider that? Malcolm, how would you answer that now after the conversation? Should Twitter be decentralized? I think that question, I don't like that question because I think the both should coexist. Twitter by itself should and can exist for its own purpose. And there should also be decentralized versions of Twitter for other purposes. So I think it's a, a coexistence is, is my answer. So it's not an either or. Wow. I love that. Um, decentral Twitter. Uh, yeah. But isn't, isn't, that, isn't that Mastodon? Uh, there's many. Mastodon is one of them. But Twitter themselves, imagine if they created a parallel Twitter, a decentralized version of Twitter and asked people, I, I think that's a, that's a brilliant one. I think I'll go with that one. I can't beat it. I, I think after this conversation, I, I would answer the same way. I, I would say that Twitter should take part of its source code and open source it, um, make it, make it a decentralized version of that technology, which allows people to create their own uh, Twitter communities that can actually feed into Twitter main. Um, but Twitter remains Twitter. Uh, it is it, it is a in, extremely important information distribution channel that should not go away. That should be, by the way, properly stewarded. So uh, there probably needs to be a change in leadership again. Um, but it should remain centralized, in my opinion. It's too important to, to 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 experiment with that network with the masses, at least right now. So um, there is value to individual visual ownership or sovereign ownership of. Twitter networks and whatnot. So create a version of it that allows people to, to, uh, to, to own that. Hey, Gary, I think uh, you need to call your friend Elon as we, and, uh, and pitch this idea to him. Yeah. The problem is if I text him, it's going to end up in the news, you know, it's go inevitably going to be leaked and yeah, all sorts of bad things. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, joining me in this conversation about whether or not Twitter should be uh, decentralized. As always, we've come up with more questions than actual <laughs> answers, but it's okay. We got to drink some good whiskey and, and, and see each other uh, at least virtually. This has been Web3 and Whiskey. Thank you for joining us for this podcast. Please subscribe on your favorite audio platform and hit the like button and subscribe button on YouTube. Uh, please also subscribe to the Departures newsletter that further explores Web3 innovations and provides explainers for the enterprise world. Join us next week for more Web3 debates and more whiskey. I'm Gary Liu. Thank you for listening. See you next time.